Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Rumpler, the Chief Communications and Government Relations Officer for North Idaho College. I just want to thank our faculty and our staff and our community members and a few retirees that have come to join us in person this morning here in the Lake Coeur Lane room. We also have quite a number of folks that have joined us over Zoom and we are good to go. I just got the 50. We have over 50 and climbing on Zoom. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to one of our candidates to be the next president at North Idaho College, Dr. Crum Baker. All right, I wanna make certain that I pronounce that correctly. I'm gonna just walk you through what the next hour will look like. I'll share just one or two little nuggets off Dr. Crum Baker's bio, his complete bio you can find on the website, which is at North Idaho College, www.nic.edu, and then slash presidential search. There you can see the complete bios of all of our candidates, as well as there is a feedback form there. So I'm gonna encourage everyone who has the opportunity to meet our candidates to share your thoughts about our candidates. Um, that feedback form, that information is sent directly to our search consultant, the Poly Group. They'll compile all that information and then send it to our board of trustees for consideration. The deadline to submit any comments or feedback is noon on Monday. So, Dr. Crumbaker, I'm going to just share a tiny bit about you and then you can go ahead before we dive in about yourself. Sound good? So, Dr. Crumbaker, um, oh, thank you, Baker. Now that I thought about it, I'm going to, Crumb Baker, thank you so much. Um, is currently the provost and executive vice president for academic and student affairs at West Virginia University Parksburg, where he works to foster creativity and innovation at the institution. While I was introducing myself to him, I, I saw that he is a fellow Rotarian and has been a longstanding Rotarian and is involved in a lot of service projects and um, involved in his community. While he's not at work, he likes to be on a soccer field with his wife, watching his two sons play soccer. And I've spent many, many a rainy spring and a sunshiny fall on the soccer field as well. So just wanted to turn it over to you to make some introductory remarks. And again, welcome to North Idaho College. Thank you. And I appreciate everybody coming out this morning and also uh, virtually, as we know, it's become the new norm uh, and at one time we would have packed probably an auditorium someplace for this kind of meeting, but now we can kind of do it in various ways. And I think that's uh, really an important part of where we, the things that we're doing in higher education moving forward. And uh, you're already seeing that as, as, we, as we move forward and see how are we going to work through enrollment? Uh, what are we gonna do programmatically in all of those? really important parts and important features of what we do in higher education, and particularly in the community college environment. Uh, I wanted to share just a brief piece of my philosophy, and I, so I'm gonna state it really clearly, is that I think that colleges, higher education, community colleges are cool. And why I say they're cool is that they advance education towards jobs and careers and dreams in ways that almost nothing else can do. We know this, that higher education, uh, particularly community colleges are doing the lion's share of the work of that. They're doing that um, and changing lives through, through the opportunities that we provide. And I think uh, probably one of the most important things that I wanna think about um, in this moment is that I like to ask this question of everybody that I interact with and it's uh, hypothetical, but I think it's a thinker. And that is no matter what you do at an institution, you should ask, what do students learn from you? Because we're all here teaching students something. We're teaching them the way to the future. We're hoping to meet them to their goals. Doesn't matter what role we have at the institution, we do this because we want to teach students and we want them to pursue their dreams and their goals and, and really have fulfilling lives. And ultimately, I think how we can do that, and when I go back to the cool statement is that we have ways to rethink how we give training, education, and opportunity to students. And we're flexible. We have flexibility around how we can really meet those needs very specifically and do our education and our training and all those opportunities for, for students in new and innovative ways that really connect them to what it is that they have in their heart and their passion and what they're trying to do to change their own lives and their families' lives. Right. Thank you, Dr. Crumbaker. 
If you haven't had the opportunity, um, I am inspired often by our students. And if you haven't seen on our social media pages, both uh, uh, on Instagram and on Facebook and a couple of other platforms, we had an awesome ASNIC president, our student body president, give such an inspiring speech at uh, graduation. And there are some days where I just watch that video for a couple of minutes and I'm just reinvigorated to start the day and focus on what we do for students. So thank you for your introductory comments. I'm gonna move into the first question if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Okay. So why are you interested in coming to or moving to North Idaho and what is your understanding of both the advantages and the challenges of our region? Oh, the great question. Uh, so I, I'll tell you first, I, I'm interested in North Idaho. Uh, I, this is my first visit here, but I'm interested in it. I mean, it's a gorgeous place, as you all know. That does, there's no mystery to that. You show up and immediately you see that. But I think the, the opportunities that are here to really serve a significant student population in our region, to be an economic driver, those are the things I'm looking for in, in personally and professionally, and I wanna be a part of. And so that's what drives me to this area. There's a lot of you know, new things happening, there's new innovations, there's new opportunities, there's new employment, uh, and those connections are what drives me in that, in that way. So when I think about why am I here now, you know, I like, I like where I am. I, you know, I like my role at, uh, in West Virginia, and I like it a lot. Uh, but I also think that it's important to uh, remember something I think of this way, and, and it's that um, the best things in life are at the exit ramp to your comfort zone. And, I, and as I think about that, that's one of the reasons that, you know, I put my, put my application in here as I was looking at um, opportunities, is that I'm, I want to see those, those ways and how can we, you know, how can we work together and do things and make, you know, I already mentioned this, but how do we make higher education cool together? I think that's, those are the incredible opportunities. Um, there are lots of positives. I kind of shared some of those. I think, you know, you, you have uh, tremendous facilities. The, the, the campus is gorgeous. It has lots of new things happening. Uh, you know, I just saw uh, what is already a really nice health science facility that's getting a massive expansion. That's a huge area, huge opportunity. We know that um, across the country, healthcare jobs uh, and roles and careers are increasing. Um, those, that's a huge thing that we can continue to build. There's also a lot of opportunities in, in, in really the, uh, the construction area, the construction industry, uh, in terms of really tying more students, more young people in particular, but also folks looking at transitioning into those kinds of careers. Uh, and I've seen your, I haven't visited your, set, your tech centers and those things, but I look forward to doing that tomorrow. Uh, that those are incredible opportunities to tie more people into these lifelong careers that are gonna be um, you know, big, they're gonna be high dollar, high wage um, occupations over time, uh, and they already are. So I think those are some really tremendous benefits. Um, you obviously have, you know, the other, the other components being residential, and you have the athletic programs, those are important towards uh, opportunities. In terms of the challenges, you know, we always have, uh, I mean, there's no mystery, there's, you know, some things about governance that we have to deal with, those are obvious, con you know, things that have to be figured out. Uh, those are those are challenges and obstacles. Everybody's got to continue serving our mission, which is students, and we're trying to do this for students. How do we really navigate those things? Accreditation, obviously, that's a that's a challenge, uh, and that's your biggest item. You know, ultimately, if they take that away, then then what? Where do you stand? Uh, but you know, those are challenges. I think um, obviously the increasing cost of everything is a challenge. That's uh, and it's across everywhere in the country. And uh, so that's another big challenge I think that's out there is how do we support students as things get more expensive. Uh, I'm, I thought about this the other day um, on my campus, there was a question about schedules, course schedules, and, I, and the fact that students now are worried about $5 a gallon gas and higher. We don't know where it's stopping. Uh, and you can, you, I, and what the, my thought was is you can't design an effective and efficient course schedule that takes into account that now a student is worried about coming to class five days a week versus two, they wanna come two days a week because they, that significant cost advantage of not having to travel by car at five and a half dollars a gallon of gas, those kind of things. Um, I think those are challenges for students. They're gonna be challenges for us uh, as employees um, and as, you know, just in our lives, all those things we know that are they're there. Housing obviously is gonna be, is a big factor as well. 
Thank you. Many moving pieces here at North Idaho College and all across the country. Sure. So your second question is, um, as you think about governance, you mentioned governance, um, governance with our board, but also college governance. So at North Idaho College, we have a participatory governance model. What is your approach to college governance and how do you involve a variety of voices when you're soliciting input, especially on controversial topics? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, participatory governance, shared governance is the key. Uh, collaborative, uh, transparent leadership and, and organizational um, governance is, is key. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to say I have um, in my role at uh, WV Parkersburg, I've been in like every instructional position you can have. I started as an adjunct and became the chief academic officer. So I only say that to say I have lots of those perspectives, but there's a whole bunch of perspectives that I don't have. And not just that, because I have them in a personal level, everybody in this room, everybody online, they have their own perspective on problems and challenges. And most importantly, they have new and innovative ways to deal with those challenges. And I think participatory governance, a big piece of that is trying to get those voices to get those understanding. Where are we missing? We have blind spots. We all come with blind spots in how we think through problem solving, how to deal with challenges, how to make new changes that have consequences and those blind spots then create lots of animosity, ill will, it reduces motivation. So how do we participate in that? Uh, my experiences around that, I mean, I think one of the big ones on the faculty side obviously is curriculum development, program development. And my role in that has been to encourage the kind of the wide lane that you drive in, in terms of trying to figure out what is what do new programs look like? What are the what are the courses going to be? What are the outcomes of those programs? You bring those, and those are faculty-led processes, not administratively-led processes. And I think that's a key piece is to really bring people to the table. You have to interact. You got to have regular communication ways. Uh, you know, work with uh, faculty assemblies and senates to work those ways. Same with staff councils and those related groups. Students, students, we're the ones. They're the ones that we impact the most. Sometimes we leave them out of that shared governance or participatory governance model. How we have to just interact, we have to build relationships and create partnerships. We're trying to meet people where, you know, where it's going to motivate them and that they're a part of the process. And I think a key piece is relationship building. It's also sharing much as much information as you can. There are things that you can't share, but, you know, we all know that there are things like that. But at the same point, putting things on the table, letting people know why decisions are made how it is that we can improve. Those are all opportunities. You gotta have, you have to be willing to listen and not do all the talking. Um, it's kind of a weird moment when I'm doing all the talking to say that, but that's a, that's a big piece is to really be listening. If I'm doing all the talking, then you know what I'm missing your voice. And I think that's an important piece. And I would encourage um, all of my uh, leadership team to be doing that same thing all the way down. We need to listen everywhere. So thanks. Thank you. So North Idaho College is a comprehensive community college, and we serve a wide variety of students. And this question is about how will you facilitate and promote a holistic approach to education that includes students who are looking for that formal, informal learning um, for credit, not credit, on-campus, virtual, formal schedule, flexible schedule, everything and all in between. That's it. There's all the moving parts. So there's the challenge, right? We all probably, I, I don't know about you all, but I do lose sleep over those things. How is it that with so many, only so many resources, can we meet all those potential uh, um, constituencies and needs? I already gave you the example of the one thing. Uh, a few years ago, I worked with a group of, in the academics to create really efficient and effective course scheduling. And now here we are at five dollars a gallon and thinking, Okay, well, now if we had a plan for someone to go four days a week in the morning, they now want to go two days a week all day because they save money. I already gave you that example, but uh, you know, how do we approach that model? I think we do have, we got to be flex flexible. We need to look at opportunities like uh, open labs where you can, you can learn skills that then you apply them in open areas during times that make sense. Uh, we need to look at non-credit to credit conversions. So we have some students that maybe they want to pursue a particular uh, skill set. They want to do that right now. They want to get employed. They want to get re-employed or up-employed, whichever it is. Uh, and that's their first step. 
but we need to have it build into an opportunity to make it a industry recognized credential if it doesn't do that at the first part but it, then it does it at someplace else at different levels. And if somebody ultimately wants to get a bachelor's degree or beyond, we need to create opportunities to tie those things in together. And I think that's one, that's a big way that we can look at those people that are thinking, well, I don't necessarily want to come. I'm, I'm out of straight out of high school. I don't want the, you know, the stuffy um, book learning and, and uh, you know, where I'm sitting in the library, just pouring through a book with a highlighter. They don't necessarily want that. They want a hands-on um approach but they're not looking they're done with we're done with that for right now they'll see the opportunities and building in all those kinds of things and looking at how do we create kind of technical programs that maybe are on the shorter part we also need to look at um look at classes and how we deliver programs is beyond the four four walls of a classroom perhaps to and how we look at semester schedules and maybe they they should be shorter uh how do we do um what i like to call uh, technology enabled instruction to provide more flexibility around those kinds of opportunities. Those are all the ways that we have to really then look and see how do we make instruction work in that way? How do we teach people with these new models out there that create flexibility for the way that the learners want to meet us and do that with limited resources? You know, we have an incredible opportunity today. The flexibility that they wanted really in 2019 uh, was already there. And then in 2020, it exploded in the flexibility and the convenience nature. Uh, you know, today, as we know, there's people uh, right now attending this by Zoom because there's that convenience component. Well, students want that too, but now we have this incredible opportunity with the technology to do different things there with video conferencing, but also using LMS. Uh, we also have opportunities to look at how can we kind of bring that education out to the tra training center so it's closer to them that they can get those experiences, lab experiences. Uh, and those are just, there's lots of ways to navigate it, but that's, we have to approach it by listening to what is it they really want and not assuming we know what they want. And that'll be an important part of how you discern, decide what's the, what's the way we meet all those various needs. So this next question, Dr. Crumbaker, is a little bit about looking at what you've done and then where you would go um, with, how have you raised morale and create a sense of community for employees and students? And how would you approach doing that, raising a sense of morale and community for employees and students here at North Idaho College? Yeah, so uh, so I'm a believer. There's actually a sign in my office that I say that those who do the work do the learning. And I think that uh, what that means to me is that particularly towards students, but towards all of us, that the learning is excitement. That's the enjoyment part. So us that do it, so when we get students hands-on with their projects, with the work they're doing, they get excited about that. If they can see the end product to it, that's the, that's the most important thing. I, I'm a, I, I started a legal studies program, and one of the things I did every day in my classes was try to teach students to be like who I would hire to work in my law office. And the important part of that was getting them doing the work that uh, is is there and they get excited about the program because they get excited about their education in that way. Um, so when I think about how do you get people excited around and, and build morale, it's getting them involved in the processes. And, you know, right now, I think one of the big things is when the more that we've been away over the last couple of years, it's hard to build morale uh, because we're not together. So some of the things that I used to do um, previously, you know, prior to 2020, to build morale is, is really look at team building activities and how do we create opportunities for us to interact as humans that serve a mission that we're here on purpose. We come to higher education, a lot of our jobs could be maybe somewhere else, but that we come to higher education because we wanna teach people. But we, to teach people better and to interact and build student morale, it has to start with the people that work there, that teach them, interact with them. Uh, you know, things that we've done in the past uh, that I think is important is do professional development and through our Center for Teaching and Professional Excellence that, that we've had, we actually build in also that cultural and that workplace culture component to try to connect people to each other. One of the things that we're seeing, I think, right now after the time of the pandemic, there's been job changes, new people coming on and other people leaving. Well, now we're starting to not know some of the people around us. Uh, and they, we don't know who they are, what their role is. 
they feel isolated from all the people they haven't seen in, the, in a period of time and connecting people towards the fun of what we do. It's not just work, it's fun too. And we need to, we can combine those two things and build them through, you know, fun activities. Maybe it's teaching more about a particular division through them hosting a professional development. And maybe that includes bringing lunch or serving a particular type of lunch or those kinds of things that we've done that I've been involved in, in in the past. Moving forward, I think it is, it's bringing people back together in ways that it makes sense that we can do in a safe way. If that's, you know, as hopefully we're, we're getting in a new place with that, but that's going to be important. Connecting people with each other and what their jobs are and how they impact the, the whole. And I think explaining together that process is a big part of morale, but ultimately morale is about trust and uh, self-efficacy. And so we need to know that we can trust our leadership, that we can trust each other. I think that's important to morale. And the other part is that we are trusted then ourselves to do the jobs that we're hired to do and that we can do them in ways that aren't um, overly managed, that they provide ways that we can try to solve the problems and do in ways that are fulfilling to us uh, and build momentum and, and morale around that motivation. You're doing great on time. So the first question, you shared a little bit about some of the advantages and challenges you saw in the region, as well as in higher education in general across the country. This next question is more specific with regards to potentially being our next college president. What challenges do you see the next president facing and how do you plan on addressing them? Yeah, um, obviously there's a lot of, challenge around the boards, make up what that looks like, how um, the day-to-day -day operations are going to look like going forward. Those are, that's a huge challenge that is directly then related to two other huge challenges, accreditation, breathing down the necks of the institution uh, and the in risk management, the insurance component. Those are all really important pieces of challenges that are there. Um, and, and then I think probably those are probably the things that are the wave that seem are there, but this other really important part of addressing that is that there are a lot of, um, there's been a lot of turnover and then a lot of interim titles that I see. And so you don't have a solid um, look at that leadership team. That's a big piece. Having people in the right places that are, you know, in that as a regular position are huge in terms of being able to address all of those things collectively. So, uh, I see those as the big challenges that are there. Um, obviously, I, I think that you all um, already are aware of those things, but those are gonna be the key and putting the people in places that make sense and that can really drive the team and the day-to-day -day operations, the vision and the mission going forward are gonna be the key to addressing those things. Um, so from my perspective, you know, one thing is, I mean, I'm not familiar with all the ins and outs of that. So from my, I'm going to rely on the institution and the people here to help me navigate that, to collaborate, be transparent about what I know and I don't know, uh, what I understand and what I don't understand, and to build trust and confidence in the fact that we're, we can do it. We'll be able to figure out how to move forward. Ultimately, I'm in this, I'm in, I'm right here right now because I care about student success. I care about students pursuing their dreams. That's why I'm here. And I think if we can center what we do around that and start addressing those other areas, uh, I think maybe my unique background coming from the, as a lawyer is helpful uh, to some level in terms of navigating some risk management, some of those kinds of policies, procedures, components. Um, negotiation and mediation is something that I also spent some significant time in my career doing. Um, so those are ways I'd look at approaching it, but it really comes down to you all working with you all collaboratively, transparently, and coming up with ways that we can move uh, and create, set our vision, continue our vision together uh, in positive ways. And we'll address those things. It may not be easy, but uh, I'm not afraid of that either. That's, and I know that's, it needs to happen. If we're gonna serve students, we gotta do something and move forward. Thank you. So this next question's written in a way, if you don't mind, I'm gonna split it into two separate questions. As college president, what is your perspective on academic freedom? Um, yeah, so from my perspective, academic freedom is about having wide latitude in the course, in the classroom 
to deliver the content um, and the information, the learning, the critical thinking skills, maybe through sometimes controversial means, but at the same time, you have wide latitude to meet your student outcomes in your courses. And I think that's a, that's a big piece of academic freedom is how do we get students to learn the things we need them to learn to meet those workforce objectives, which is ultimately what they're after, but also to have their self-fulfillment. Um, so from my perspective, that's where academic freedom lies, uh, that we have, we try to navigate how do we get to student learning outcomes in ways that, that are effective. Um, and, you know, there's devil's advocacy and the university of ideas that are important parts of what we do as our mission is in higher education. Uh, so that's how I look at it. So then the next question as college president, what is your perspective on tenure? Yeah, I think, I mean, tenure has been part of the fabric of, of higher education throughout its existence. And so looking at that, looking at tenure as opportunities. Uh, is an important part of really growing in the long term to build to create trust and confidence uh, in the institution from the faculty standpoint so that they can build and invest in the things that will really enable them to be innovative and creative towards meeting those needs for students in the future. Um, you know, I think that's a conversation that um, that is important to have and figure out how do we identify uh, tenure, how does that work, what are the pathways uh, you know, how, who gets on those tracks and those key things are all really important components. So I think it's part of the it's part of the it's part of the institution. It's part of what we do in higher education It's something we need to consider and, and look through all the time. So, Thank you, doctor. You shared a little bit about credit, non-credit when we were talking about the holistic approach to a comprehensive community college, but I'm going to ask you to dive a little deeper. And you've had the opportunity and you'll continue to have the opportunity today to visit our um, different with different people on our main campus and of course meet with an interview with our board of trustees this afternoon. And then tomorrow, as you had alluded to, um, you're going to see the fabulous people and the facilities up at Parker Technical Education Center and then at Workforce Training Center too over in Post Falls. So um, we do have both the credit and non-program credit programs here at North Idaho College. What are some things that you might do to facilitate collaboration between those credit and non-credit programs? Yeah, I think, so first, I think that there's, that they're not, sometimes they're thought of as two separate things, but ultimately what we're trying to do is teach students, prepare them for their careers and their lives. And it's the same thing. So I, I think that one of the big ways is to connect them more specifically towards what are those outcomes that we're trying to achieve for students. As it relates to bringing the two together, and I realize then there's some geographic changes that, you know, that are related to how do you, how do you eliminate those, we're over here and you're over there. Um, we have to facilitate how, is the, how do those partnerships truly work uh, between those two groups when we look at our workforce partners, what they're looking for, how can we provide the things so we're not replicating what we do in one place or another. Uh, I think that's a big piece of really the future of, of what you, know, you do at, the con at a community college. It's gonna be looking at how we can bring those two together and maybe step in parts of them at different parts, uh, at different points. So let me give you maybe more specific. As it relates to non-credit, I think we have students that come in, let's say they wanna be welders. Uh, one of the things that happens in welding is that once you learn the skills, you usually get taken to a job because you have now met that thing that they need you to have to start working. Uh, and then what happens with a welding program that maybe it's a degree program is very few students complete it because they don't take their general education courses. They don't take some of those other components. Uh, but I think that going through the short term and taking those courses, they get a good job and they get a job for a period of time. And then at some point, they're going to want to move to someplace else, and they're going to need enhanced communication skills, both oral and written. They're going to need to understand how other people think and how you have to work with them. Uh, and so, you know, in the social sciences component, they need to understand history and how those things play in. Uh, they need to understand what's the science of the welding. That's an important part, too. And so all those things are related. And also, you know, one thing I know, and uh, my uncle would, would uh, be mad at me for saying this, but my my uncle is a sheet metal worker. He can create the neatest stuff out of uh, sheet metal. And I once called him an artist and I thought he was going to punch me in the face because in his mind, he's just a really good craftsman. And he is, but he's also an artist. And I think 
knowing all those components, work should both be good structurally and be done well and will hold up, but also should look good. People, we know that there's a cool factor. As I go around campus, I see a lot of new cool factor things that are happening. There's a reason that you're building facilities that look cooler, that make students more interested in what they're doing and they have neat new lounges and new furniture. That's because we like that. Um, and so I think understanding those components and how they tie together are really important. And we can build non-credit programs that build into degree programs. We can do that, those kinds of things, particularly as we find that employers at all levels are right now saying that, I mean, you can look at different surveys, but one I looked at recently talks about what are the things that employers are wanting to see from, from employees, entry-level employees, communication skills, critical thinking, analytical skills, math skills, um, how to interact with other people, how not to make everybody mad, all those kinds of things in the workplace. I am paraphrasing some of those. And at the very bottom, like the lowest percentage thing that they're worried about, employers are worried about are the other skills. And those are the things that they're going to, that's the work they do probably. So maybe that's the thing that they're in, they're, uh, you know, in fabrication. That might be what they're doing there. They're built, they're working in the industrial line. They're running the chemicals in the chemical company, um, those kinds of things. That's the last thing they're interested in. They really want that. Don't get me wrong. But what are they saying is missing? Those other things that we know are part of the traditional higher education post-secondary model. And those things are important as we look forward and how do we blend those together. Both things are important. That's what's going to future. That's what employers are looking for, uh, particularly people that can take some numbers, figure out what they can mean, solve a new problem with them, and move forward in a way that they can communicate. Those are all really important uh, pieces. And I think those are the ways that those can tie together. We have to not be separated. We need to think about how we collectively solve those workforce challenges, the student challenges. And I think we can do that through non-credit and credit as a combination effort. Actually, we're uniquely positioned in higher education to do that as opposed to others, certainly for you. So we're to our final question, but it's a multi-part question. So I'm gonna split it up into, yes, you're welcome, into to many questions, many succinct, but individual questions, and yet they will build on each other. So just kind of give you a little preview. How do you develop talent at an institution? I think, well, one, you have to build trust and confidence. And so that's the, that's the main thing, but you also have to provide resources and opportunity. So you have to look at folks and help them to build as professionals and as people. And so I think that's the first place you empower. You also, uh, you know, provide the, uh, I think a big piece is professionalism or professional development and resources. You don't send people down to do a job and then don't give them the things they need to perform it because it's very hard to then be successful. And as you develop that talent, uh, you know, I think you do some, you do it internally and you look at opportunities to build and to have people build skills that are particular to our area, the, the area of focus. I think higher education, we have some unique job classifications that, uh, you know, probably aren't external people that are, would, would be able to hit the ground running and developing people into those skills. We're here again, as I said, we're here to follow a mission. We have a particular interest in serving students and serving them in their future and are serving our region in that way. Uh, and so there are skills that we have to build, there are leadership management skills that have to be given. Higher education is also particularly bad. I think about promoting people to management positions without management training and leadership training. So they get there because they're really good at something and they go to the next place uh, and we haven't provided those resources. Um, that's a big piece of developing talent, providing those opportunities, but building trust and confidence um, and, and providing opportunity to, to go to those places, take on new projects and have successes. But it's also really important that we learn how to win and we learn how to fail because learning how to fail is probably more important because by failure, you can learn where you messed up and you can learn from it. And that's how you develop too. You gotta have comfortable, you gotta be comfortable in being developed. And then the next part of this continuing question is, how do you help employees at all levels of the institution gain new skills? Yeah, I think, I mean, we can, I can sit in my office, I suppose, and come up with lots of good things I wish everybody knew more about, but that doesn't mean anything to everybody that works here. 
you, we have to ask, what is it that you need? What are those things that you wish that you had to help you do your job better? We need to ask those things and then we need to provide opportunities to pursue them. Maybe those are big sessions where more people need to know about um, you know, the processes that happen at the institution, but maybe they're more individual. I need to know more about a new thing that uh, you know, was, was being talked about in, in, you know, before 2020, but is clearly there now and that's digital pedagogy. It's a whole new topic that when we talk about how are we going to instruct students in a new way, we need to know, we got to be given those opportunities, but we need to be ready for them. And so we can do lots of professional development. If you're not ready to accept it or do anything with it and then turn around and apply it, it goes away. It's a, it's a, it's a resource that we spent. It's a re time that you spent that didn't really advance you. And so looking at what specifically, what are those needs? Not assuming what those needs are. Same for students. We shouldn't assume what students need. We need to ask them. We need to ask people what they need. How can we provide those opportunities and give them skill development that, that in professional development that's important to them? And then the last part of the question, while it may sound simplistic, it could be quite profound. How do you keep good people? Yeah, that's hard. Um, you know, from, from one point, uh, I think that it's it's it can be if somebody leaves you and is able to advance because they build skills with you, that's a success in my opinion. So I want people to stay, obviously, um, but at the same time, I want them to be able to pursue the things that are good for them. And so I think building people that are, um, you know, attractive to other employers and is an important way to keep people because you've built people into a place that they're fulfilled in their job, that they're, they're pursuing those opportunities. And I think self-efficacy is an important part so is they need to have, you have to have importance around the trust and confidence you can do your job well, and that you can do it. I gave you that job because you can do it. And how do you get to the result that you want? Uh, having those kinds of things are really important to keeping people around. Um, everybody likes to make more money. We all know that. I mean, there's no mystery to that. We don't do this just as volunteers. Uh, and, but at the same time, that isn't everything. There's a lot of other intangible things, things that aren't money, that aren't a nicer office or a nicer furniture that make us fulfilled and make it worthwhile to do and why we'll stay. And that's probably the biggest piece. Why is it that you stay? Why will good people stay? I think it's because they're, they're, they know there's trust and confidence in them and their abilities that they can get their job done. They don't need to be micromanaged. And that they need to, and then at the same way, they trust and con have confidence in their leadership. Well, thank you, Dr. Crumb Baker. That ends our formal questions. You have some time left. I mean, this is your time. The floor is yours. Uh, and if you want me to go back and ask you a question again for you to elaborate on, or if you just want to share more about yourself or your experiences um, with the folks that are here, please do so. Sure. Um, so I as I was looking through some of the materials, uh, I, I noticed that a lot of emphasis on student success. And as we talk about student success, enrollment management, recruiting, how do we deal with enrollment? I think there's a lot to that puzzle. And enrollment management is a great term for it. Maybe it's self-descriptive, um, but also too descriptive or undescriptive. I don't know, maybe overbroad or something. Uh, and so it's vague at the same time. But as far as keeping students or getting students and keeping students, I, I think it's really important to be paying attention to retention and how we can provide students that the opportunity to stay with us. You know, it, it's not a mystery, but the uh, there's that saying that a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. Well, that's that's obvious. I think we all know that. But how do we do it? I think is about retention, but it's also being very intentional about how we interact with students, how we make sure we're being in their face maybe is the way there's that whole thing about proactive advising is the new term for what was previously called um, intrusive advising. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong. I don't think it's intrusive in a negative way, but I get the words are different, uh, but we should be intrusive. We should use data to help us know where are those students falling behind. And then we need to go find them and figure out how we can help them. And then when we see patterns, we need to fix our system to help identify it sooner so we can get to them before we lose them. How many students have we have, do you all have every day that have been long since gone before we realized that we should have done something for them and now we can't reach them? We can call them, text them, email them, maybe knock on their door. That'd be kind of 
scary, but that's really intrusive. Um, but how do we make sure that they're not so far gone that we still have a chance to grab them and help them and those kinds of things? Uh, and, and I think retention and proactive advising, everything, I would say I'm using advising as a very broad term for things that we do maybe as counselors. I mean, we're here, again, we're here to serve that particular mission. We all are teaching students something. We're learn they're learning something from us. We're here to pursue their success. We're all advisors in that sense. How do we notice the ones that are missing? How do we notice the ones that maybe we can kind of tell are having a bad day or having a bad week or month? And how do we do something about that? And data can help us with that. The ones that are, they're not attending classes, we can be aware. We know pretty well about students and how when they're in front of us, they visit us often. We know about those students and how they're doing. What about all those ones we don't, that we don't see? They don't come to see us. They don't ask us any questions. And if we can create more systems that enable them to kind of follow up around that, I think it's really important towards retention. But I'll fast forward that intentionality to new students, and we need to make sure that they're getting all the things along the way. We're not losing touch with them from the time they apply to the time that they uh, finish with us or get into classes. I call that uh, model. I have something that I, I wrote up at one point just to kind of describe the process. I call it the life cycle of the student. But basically, it talks about the student from each step in the process that they go through. They have a status with us. The basic status is they apply. So they're an applicant. And the next thing they do is they register, right? So we're trying to get a student from applying to, well, maybe admitted to a registrant. But each step in that process requires lots of innovation or interventions. If you think about how many, I don't know if it, it's crossed your mind, but from the time a student decides that three in the morning to apply to the college, what are all the things that people have to do to get them past that stage? So the computer does some of it probably, but there are lots of offices involved in the next step. But certainly when we move between once you're admitted and you're trying to get registered, there are lots of steps because you got to get in paid status. So you got financial aids involved, all these different interventions that happen. If we're not intentional about them, we may get 5,000 applications, but only 500 students apply to actually show up the first day of class and even fewer. And we, you know, throughout the first semester in the first year. Well, anyway, I think that's an important process around enrollment, um, but so there's some that I wanted to share kind of about that topic. Ultimately, I'm about entrepreneurialism and creativity and innovation. And I do that, I think, through collaboration and transparency. Uh, those are lots of big buzzwords, but I really mean them. That's what I think of as the opportunity in higher education is to be innovative and entrepreneurial. How can we tie students to the jobs of the future? Uh, you probably know this. They're um, and I like this example. My grandfather was a typewriter repairman. And that job ceased to exist like 40 years ago. But he did his entire career as a typewriter repairman. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, they've transitioned into new things. But I think the reality is that that same period of time, he could do a whole career on that. There are students today, they're going to graduate, they're going to start a career in something similar, that it won't make it all the way through an entire career. And it's going to be a new job, and they're going to have to create that new job. And we need to build in them that entrepreneurialism that they understand that solving problems in new ways leads to new jobs, new careers, and new opportunities. And that's what we can do. We can help build that spirit. We can build those basic skills. I listed off kind of some of those that exist that employers are looking for. Those create lifelong learners that know how to then adapt to the changing opportunities in the world. And that's really, I think that's where we can go forward in higher education. That's where we could go forward here in North Idaho College. And so that's, I'll kind of leave it on that. And there's other things we want to add. Oh, thank you so much. And on behalf of my colleagues on President's Cabinet and on behalf of the faculty and the staff and the students and our guests and our community members, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for taking all these multiple steps to get here today um, to show your interest uh, in North Idaho College and your desire to be our next president. So really appreciate you being here today. I know 
you have many more exciting adventures for you, the rest of your day. And thank you for everyone who, who came to support this process. Don't forget on our website, of course, www.nic.edu slash presidential search is the opportunity to, to get to read the entire bio of Dr. Crum Baker and also our other candidates, as well as the opportunity for you to give your feedback um, and provide input on this process. So thanks and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.